This is CBC Here and Now. I do think that people should be watching their speeds at all times. The rain yesterday was very heavy. It just wasn't ideal to be driving even 110 kilometers an hour. Caught on camera. Another dash cam video captures a stunning near miss on our highways. Police are still investigating forest fire here in Kenmount Terrace, but new drone footage shows just how bad the fire was. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'll show you that video coming up. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Arianna Kellen. Well, we start tonight with more shocking dash cam footage. Another near miss on our highways. This time on the Outer Ring Road, here now's Katie Breen is standing by. Well, Katie, you talked about two reckless driving videos on the show just last week. Now there appears to be another. That's right. First, we saw a motorcycle zooming between cars, then a near miss as a driver pulled out, almost getting into a head-on collision, trying to make a pass without enough room. Now there's this. You see the black car on the left, hydroplane, fishtail, and whip around, circling nearly 360 degrees before coming to a stop. Kayla Squires recorded the video yesterday. She stopped alongside that car after it spun out and could see the shocked expression on that driver's face. The driver claimed she was going 110 kilometers an hour above the speed limit and too fast for the wet conditions. I wouldn't say that I'm scared, but I'm always defensively driving all the time. I mean, you can be as best as a driver as you can be, do everything by the books as, you know, I was yesterday, but then it does unfortunately take a misjudgment or, you know, somebody not really thinking about things the way they should be that could have ended up much, much worse. She says it could have been much worse, and so does Safety NL. A driving instructor I spoke with today said if that car had to flip, the level of personal injury would have been unthinkable. If you're in a situation like that, and you're behind somebody, and you see that they're driving in a manner that's less than safe, you give them, first of all, lots and lots of room. The only road you can control is the road ahead of you. So you increase your time and space between that vehicle. That's the only thing that's going to save you because that person was totally out of control. That was purely providential that that person wasn't killed. Singleton says he's seeing more and more dash cam footage, something he says you would think would make people slow down given the fact that they could possibly be recorded. But dash cams don't seem to be too much of a deterrent. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. It was quite the scene at the Deep Cove Marina in Musgrave Town yesterday. A man was attempting to launch his boat when the brakes on the pickup truck he was driving reportedly gave way. According to Decker Towing and Recovery, who shared video online, a couple of hundred people came down to watch as the crew plucked the pickup from the water. The driver was a little wet, but not injured. Drone footage shot over the weekend shows just how close a forest fire came to destroying a St. John's suburb. Now, Joseph Dawson filmed the aftermath of last week's fire in the Kemount Terrace subdivision and the scorched earth left behind. This drone footage also uncovered something amongst the burnt brush, a homemade wooden shack. Now, while the cause of the fire is still under investigation, the discovery of that makeshift shed is something new. Here now is Jeremy Eaton went to the area to take a look around. It's a fire that folks in Kenmount Terrace won't forget. Last Monday afternoon, rising flames and thick black smoke could be seen all over the city. Thanks to fast-acting firefighters and a nearby water bomber, the damage was minimal. A few patios lost and some siding melted. From the bird's eye view of a drone, you can see just how bad the fire was. But if you look closely, you can see something still standing there amongst the charred ruins. You can still see and smell the remnants of the fire last week here in Kenmount Terrace. Now, in that drone video, you can see what appears to be a shack at the center of it. So I decided to come up here and take a closer look to see what I could find. Over a blackened forest floor, pushing aside burned out trees, then stepping over some. From the black, there is green, and then something in the distance. And it doesn't take long to find 
this shack. Now, I am not a trained arson investigator. All I can do is describe what I see, which is burning almost all the way around the shack, a full circle, but no actual fire damage to the shack itself. On the ground, juice, some water bottles, even an unopened granola bar. This does not appear to be an abandoned space. Burned out cans of Coke laid on the charred ground. A few chairs remain and a well-worn path in and out of here. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary says the fire is still under investigation. Police officers are aware of the shack and it is something that they're looking into. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Boy, that is chilling looking at those Incredible. pictures and to see the expanse of all that charred land. Wow. So, to yes. the weather. <laughs> to the weather. It's, it's very balmy, isn't it? It is very balmy. Sticky. It's very warm. Some places in particular are getting very, very warm. I'll get to that in just a moment. But first, let's have a look at the situation uh, right now. Here we are with our radar. Heading over to the green screen here, Roddy. And uh, yeah, we have uh, some showers coming down uh, over the island in the east throughout the day today. And that trend of wet weather will be continuing, as you can see here. This is part of the post-tropical storm barrel. Some of the remnants of that storm bringing some wet weather to parts of the island. And we do have this special weather statement in effect because of the potential for downpours in a very short period of time. And and also, we have a heat warning in effect for parts of Labrador and for the west coast of the island and parts of central, as well as a fog advisory for the uh, south coast of the island. And when you open your eyes tomorrow morning, this is what you're going to see out your window. Some nice warm temperatures to start the day, but it will be getting much warmer in some places. I'll have those details coming up. makes me excited for the future and where this place could go. A nice walk through town and show our support for our LGBTQ plus community. The town of Gander held its first Pride Walk today as part of Pride celebrations. That story is coming up in 10 minutes, plus a look at some of the flag raising Pride events in St. John's. It has been a tragic few days on the water. Four people have died since Thursday. Yesterday, police located the body of a missing Makovic fisherman who hadn't been seen in a few days. His body was found in shallow water near Hawks Cliff. In Marystown, RCMP say a 68-year-old man drowned while trout fishing on the Buren Peninsula on Friday. Two men were in the canoe when it tipped over. Both were wearing life jackets, but only one managed to swim to safety. And in Labrador, there's an intensive search in Northwest River for 43-year-old Luke Cooper. Cooper and a woman were on the water on Sunday when their canoe tipped over. Sheila Cooper, Luke Cooper's sister, says the two had been drinking. The woman made it ashore, but Luke Cooper remains unaccounted for. The swamped canoe was located several kilometers north northeast of the town. RCMP divers on the scene this morning and many in the community are helping out where they can. What do you think it says about the community that so many people do want to step up and help and are bringing food and drinks and lunches and things like that? It shows that the community is a very close-knit community. Um, there's a lot of good things and a lot of good people in this community. And any time you, know, you have an event where you, know, you have a situation where someone uh, in, in need, um, it goes to show the true colors of the community. Um, there has been a lot of support in regards to food and donations as well as support for the search. But it's a positive aspect of it, mm. but to a very sad situation. And in Cartwright, the recovery mission to find the body of 67-year-old Raymond Green continues. Green was on the Eagle River with two U.S. tourists when his boat capsized on Thursday. The two men were rescued by a nearby tour boat, but Green is presumed to have drowned. Green's wife, Phoebe Davis, says she takes some solace in knowing he died doing what he loved, being outside in nature. Outside, out, outdoors, anything outdoors. He loved to read. He loved to. He, he was like a, he was an intellectual person, as well as an outdoor person. He loved to hunt and fish and drive around, play with the grandkids. 
It's been one month since Trevor Hamlin vanished from his paradise home, and tonight police say volunteers have recovered one piece of evidence. Hamlin's smartphone was found in a wooded area in Paradise. It was discovered by Hamlin's friends and family on June 25th, more than a week after he disappeared. Police, uh, police also confirmed today that his bank accounts have not been accessed in a month. They are renewing the call for residents of Imogene Crescent and Trails End Drive to check CCTV and dash cam footage. It's difficult to say whether it's suspicious or not at this point based on the evidence. Uh, investigators are open-minded and it is possible that it is, it is suspicious in nature. Uh, however, it's possible there's another explanation for it or other explanations rather. Uh, so that's where, you know, speaking with witnesses, uh, trying to understand more around the circumstances of the disappearance itself, the days leading up to the disappearance is really important for investigators. Uh, investigators have spoken or have conducted interviews with over 30 people. Uh, we've canvassed the neighborhoods uh, pretty thoroughly uh, and we have received some CCTV footage from uh, residents in the area. Since police spoke publicly, Hamlin's sister posted on a Facebook page dedicated to finding him. Ashley Hamlin wrote in part, the cell phone that was found was his old phone. We are still missing his current phone. The police did search the area where the phone was found with dogs and a search team, and we even hired our own private dog tracker and did private searches, but with no results of anything else. We have no idea why the phone was there, how it got there, or how long it was there. There's criticism tonight about a new board of directors appointed to oversee Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro. The province announced the appointment of 10 people last week, six of them brand new to the position, but only one person sitting on the board is a woman. Here now's Malone Mullen has more. The Hydro Board has some fresh faces, perhaps good news for a company with big challenges ahead. But it was bad news for well-known activist Jenny Wright. Just because there are uh, nine men on that board, there does not mean that there isn't a hundred women in this province with the ability. Nine out of ten coveted spots, all filled by men. Wright says that's a problem, not only for women's rights, but for the success of a company no stranger to controversy. Most of the research that's been coming out for the last 10 years has showed boards which have strong women on the board and strong diversity on the board have a higher ROI coming back. They're much more stronger. They do well. They're far more innovative than those who don't. And so we would expect an organization, you know, like our government, like NALCOR, to understand that data. Anyone can apply for these positions, but according to the Appointments Commission, ability trumps diversity. When you think in terms of the potential impact, of Hydro Corporation and Nalcor uh, on the uh, future of this province, those appointed will face very significant challenges and have to be able to meet those challenges. Wright thinks in this case the commission could have made more of an effort to make sure those with ability were also women. That's very disappointing to hear. Women are often have to ask between seven and nine times before they will even apply. That there's a million barriers in front of them to apply for those jobs already. So the fact that you got the job has very little to do with ability. But the ultimate decision rests with the province, whose premier once flamed hydro board appointments. Both the Liberals and the NDP grilled the Premier today, wanting to know how a lawyer, two mayors and the head of a beer distribution company get chosen to sit on the boards of Nalcor and Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro. What process did you use in the search to select the appointees at Nalcor? Six years later, Wright is asking the same question. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. Late this afternoon, the Minister of Natural Resources told us more women will be added to the board. Siobhan Cody says the government is creating the four positions after noticing the gender disparity and will get the Independent Appointments Commission to search for the successful candidates. We have about 53% men appointed to boards, 47% female, so we're, we're, really, we're really getting there. Uh, we want to continue to uh, put the emphasis towards having gender balanced boards and ensuring that we have that gender balance all the way through government. And if you look at the executive of government right now, it's about a 50-50 split. So we are really putting an emphasis towards that. And that's why we left a few seats on the board of uh, Hydro so that we can recruit some more female candidates to that board. There's been a recall issued for some frozen berries because of a fear of salmonella contamination.
The Canadian Food Inspection Agency recalled Europe's best brand field berry mixes across the country. That includes the 600 gram and 2 kilogram packages. They all have a variety of best before dates, all before May 2020. If you do have these, you can return them to the store where you purchased it or throw it out. The CFIA says there have been no reported illnesses. It's Pride Week in several places in the province. And just ahead, some flag raisings and how people in Gander are showing their pride. Welcome back to Here and Now. It's officially Pride Week in several places in the province, including St. John's and Gander. A flag raising ceremony was held at the Confederation Building today as part of the Pride Week events. The Premier joined the St. John's Pride Committee to raise the flag at the courtesy poll inside as part of the ceremony. The flag is also being raised outside the building. The Confederation building will also be illuminated in pride colors for the week. The head of the pride committee says the flag has an important message. To the community at large, this flag serves as notice that we will not be shamed, that we are not twisted nor deserving or second class treatment. We love as you love, no better or worse, but equal.
and a pride flag also went up at the RCMP headquarters in St. John's. The head of the pride committee and the RCMP's assistant commissioner were on hand for the flag raising. St. John's Pride has been working to build bridges with the policing community, including allowing uniformed officers to march in the parade. That's a big difference that, uh, from other cities in the country where there's a big divide between the Pride Committee and police forces. Well, the town of Gander held its very first Pride Walk today. The walk took place after the Pride flag was raised at Town Hall and there was quite a crowd. Here now is Garrett Barry was there. Maybe it was the advertising. We did do a lot of work and sharing it on Facebook and putting the word out there. Um. Or maybe the sunny weather. Whatever the reason, today's Pride ceremony in Gander was the biggest ever. We are so, so excited. As, as we mentioned in our, our speech, um, the last few years there's only been about five or six people that showed up, um, but for some reason this year they came out in hordes and we're super excited about it. We, we want our, our, as we said, we want our LGBTQ plus community to feel supported and this obviously shows that they are. They're here and they're decked out. We're all good now. <laughs> this was a Friday night. Yeah, it was Wednesday a Friday night. night thing. Yeah, it, uh, this is Pan, Pan Pride. And how long did it take? How long did it take to put together? <laughs> oh my God! Um, it was a 3 a.m. thing. Yeah, it was. It was very early in the morning, but uh, maybe eight hours. Yeah, about that. Start to finish. Yeah. Gander's Youth Center helped organize this event, trying to let young LGBT people know that they are loved. When I was younger, um, there was a lot of um, popularity or. If you were different, it wasn't really accepted or it was shunned to be different. But now, this day and age of thankfully 2018, <laughs> we have a lot more acceptance and people are being more open-minded and learning, which is really nice. After the flag went up, the crowd took to the sidewalk for Gander's first ever Pride Walk. So why is this year's crowd so much bigger? We just wanted to take part and have our kids be a part of this and they're all they know everything like they're up on the like all the gay pride and stuff like that so it's just a wonderful opportunity for them too. Organizers say there's work left to do on LGBT issues but on this day in this town they're celebrating. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. Despite the rain in St. John's yesterday, hundreds took part in the Pride Parade from City Hall to Bannerman Park. The CBC's Andrew Sampson was at the parade and spoke with some people there. Pride means being able to accept and love who you are and being able to be proud of your identity and be able to just express yourself as a human. It's really amazing and like kind of... A, Unbelievable that there's so many people just like me and similar to me. It's just a wonderful feeling. I'm originally from here and this is Bob's first time in St. John's. And uh, it's very exciting and this parade has grown every year. And uh, I never walked in it and I'm going to march all the way through now instead of just being a bystander and I'm very excited. Tell me about being here all the way from Springdale today. How does it feel to be here at Pride? It's meaningful anywhere because of the event it is, but it was, I mean, after everything that went on, it was definitely nice to see that we were being recognized and, like, there was people who genuinely wanted this to happen, you know? It was I, nice. I was out of town, unfortunately, but you were involved. Just, yeah, yeah, a big group of CBC people. Carolyn was there with her pup, and uh, it was weird because it was raining all day, and then it kind of cleared off for the parade, and then it rained again. But it was really good turnout. It was it was a good day. <laughs> Completely different type of flying, for sure. The first of Canada's new cyclone helicopters take to the skies this week. Just ahead, we'll take you on board one of those helicopters that will replace the Sea Kings.
Weather update is brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can, too. Welcome back. Well, we're going to get to the hot weather because mm -hmm. it's sticky. I can feel yep. it now, but we have some great whale video Beautiful. to show you. Orcas, there they are. They put on a show for the passengers on the Francois or Francois ferry <laughs> going to Gray River this morning. Wow. Now the crew on board said it was the first time this season that they saw killer whales. And actually this video came from MHA Christopher Mitchellmore's account. It's incredible. Wow, great video. Fairly close, hey? Yeah. Looks a bit foggy. Is it two? Not sure. Yeah, they're beautiful, beautiful animals. Great. Nice swimming weather. The smaller one there, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the weather is uh, lots of stuff going on for the middle of summer. Uh, lots of uh, heat warnings in mm -hmm. effect and uh, lots of rain. Let's start actually by uh, looking at some of the highs for today. Wow, some impressive temperatures, especially in Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay, the hot spot today, got up to 34 degrees. And that warm weather, well, that is going to be sticking around for a while. We do have uh, all of this moisture that is just streaming towards uh, the island. And that's what's bringing us all of these rain and uh, all of the rain and all of the showers over the past uh, few days. And that trend and will likely continue over the next uh, few days. We do have a special weather statement in effect because of those showers. Uh, it's, it's there because of the potential for some downpours. 15 to 25 millimeters of rain uh, per hour uh, potential there for that kind of a downpour. So that's why that weather statement isn't in fact. We have a heat warning for the Corner Brook area up through Green Bay, White Bay and the Buckins area. So we're going to be very, very hot there tomorrow with the humid X going to feel like 35 degrees. And we have the fog advisory there for the south coast. So very dense fog there tomorrow. And that's likely to stick around for the next few days as well. And we have a heat warning as well for Labrador. You can see coast Coastal Labrador going to get really, really warm tomorrow. 38 degrees with the Humidex is what it's going to feel like in some of those areas. So as uh, we continue into uh, tomorrow, in for tonight into tomorrow rather, we do have these uh, showers that will be affecting the eastern portion of the island. And uh, you can see that overnight tonight, those temperatures are still staying pretty high. Happy Valley Goose Bay at overnight low of 21 degrees. So it's going to be sticky and warm there overnight tonight night for sure. Now we do have 10 to 30 millimeters of rain potentially for uh, the Buren Peninsula overnight tonight and about five millimeters of rain uh, for the Avalon Peninsula for this evening. And as we get in tomorrow, we you can see that there's a uh, lots of dense thick cloud cover over the island as well as some showers moving in for western Labrador. And uh, this is what you can expect tomorrow temperature wise in St. John's. We're going to be getting up to about 20 degrees with uh, uh, potential for some showers there as we move towards central. You can see things are warming up there. 25 degrees in Grand Falls, Windsor. And then as we head west, it gets warmer still where those heat warnings are in effect. 29 degrees for Humber Valley, Corner Brook getting up to 28. But once again, going to feel much warmer with that Humidex and Labrador is really the hot spot. Cartwright 30 degrees tomorrow. Happy Valley Goose Bay getting up to 33. So yeah, you'll want to stay hydrated and make sure you don't leave any pets in the car tomorrow. And that warm weather will be sticking around for a few days. So we do have more showers on the way later in the week. You can see another system coming through. I'll have those details a bit later. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. The first of Canada's new cyclone helicopters is set to be deployed this week. The fleet is replacing the retired Sea Kings. Today, the military invited some members of the media in Halifax for a look. The CBC's Carolyn Ray was one of them. Geared up and ready to go. Not just us, but our ride. The Royal Canadian Air Force has been waiting 21 years for the replacement of the Sea Kings. It's finally time for the first of the fleet to take off. It's pretty exciting for all of us here at 12 Wing. I've been calling 2018 the year of the cyclone. 
Inside, it's a smooth ride. They tether us to the helicopter and open the doors. The cyclones are faster and can go farther than their predecessors. While we might feel nervous, the crew is completely at ease. They know this system inside and out. For three years, they've been putting the cyclones to the test, hunting down the worst possible conditions to see how the helicopters will react. And they were actually storm chasing with the ship to, to find the heaviest seas they possibly could to make sure that it wasn't just about testing takeoff and landing, but also, you know, with the uh, cyclone on the deck, what, uh, what deck angles uh, were going to be... Uh, we're going to be okayed for, for the aircraft to be out on deck versus being in the hangar lashed down. On a day like today, even the crew is excited to put training aside and do a little sightseeing. Below, there's no shortage of curious onlookers wondering about this new fleet that for years was plagued with delays and technical problems. The cyclone is fly-by-wire, computerized. The calculations of wind, distance to the destination, all those things are now done by the system. It's up to the crew to cross-check the results. The main thing that I'll hear from them is it's a completely different type of flying for sure. The cyclones will be deployed on frigates, expanding the ears and the eyes of ships at sea. We fly from a ship. We're able to give the ship's captain a view over the horizon, either above the water or below the water, at much greater ranges than uh, we could in the past. And that allows decision making on the ship to take into account all the other uh, contacts that may be out there in the surrounding area. Our journey comes to an end, but the cyclone story is finally beginning. The first will be deployed with HMCS Ville de Quebec on Wednesday, a six-month mission, a piece of what is set to be a part of maritime history for decades. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, above Halifax Harbour. And remember, you can watch Here and Now while you're on the go. We're broadcasting live on YouTube, and you can also catch past episodes on demand. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBCNL. You turn kind of stem from our kitchen table and went to the trunk of my car, and then we got an office space. A new place to go for people looking for help to fight addictions. U turn has a new facility in Conception Bay North.
We go now to Carbonair, where people seeking help with their addictions have a new place to go tonight. With help from the provincial government, U-Turn has a new, bigger facility. The outreach centre was bursting at the seams just a couple of months ago as the severity and scope of addiction continued to worsen in Conception Bay North. I visited Jeff and Tammy Bourne at their new location last week. Welcome to our new home. Okay. Wow, a lot bigger than your last space. Uh, pretty much our last space with the uh, setting area, washroom, and the two offices is pretty much uh, three times bigger than where we were two before. And you had people kind of spilling out of your last room, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, there were some of our meetings. One night there was nine or ten in the hallway as you walk in the door. Uh, uh, I think it was up to 45 at that night. Wow. And how many people can you have in here now? Uh, we can set about 30 to 40 people comfortable. It's way more comfortable. Well, first of all, we have AC now, and uh, we have two bathrooms, so there's no lineup for the bathrooms anymore. A lot of people are really enjoying the space and the sunlight just pouring in. It, it really puts everybody in a much better mood. And then over here, what do we have? Well, right here is our sitting area, our little lounge area. Sometimes we'll just have like a few of us during the daytime versus nighttime. It's, it's pretty packed here. But the few during the day, we like to sit around, a little, be a little bit more intimate. I started coming in five years ago. I came in seven years when they first started because my mom loved Jeff and knew him from church and just wanted me to meet him and see what he was doing in the community because she thought was so awesome. So, and I've been coming for five years. I come steady. They're here every day. There's so many broken people out there with so many different addictions and they have no support system. So Tammy and Jeff being the healers that they are have brought such a warm, loving center available for everybody and everyone just comes and we're just multiplying. One-on-one -on -one peer support here, because uh, why it is one person helping another is huge in recovery. And also as a working process, this is going to be sort of a quiet room for when people comes in and probably got a meltdown or probably for Tammy or myself when we do like a, I guess a heavy session with somebody, at least after they leave the facility, we can come in and just turn the lights off, lay back, get our thoughts together and uh, get refocused to move forward with our day. And I remember the last time we were here, uh, or in the last space, your offices were also kind of makeshift storage areas. Yes. A storage room of sorts. So now you have your own office, both yep. of you do. It most certainly was. It was like a hundred rolls of toilet paper behind the person who was in having to chat with me. We had art supplies and uh, whatever you can cram in there. And now it's a, it's a comfortable office. Anybody wants to come in and, and have a private chat, you don't have all these things around them. It's uh, much more comfortable. Jeff, did you ever think seven years ago that you would be in this space today? Uh, no, never dreamt it in a million years. Uh, I mean, say for me, I started recovery back in 2005. U-turn uh, kind of stemmed from our kitchen table and went to the trunk of my car, and then we got an office space. But I never ever dreamt that we'd be in like a 1,300 square foot, uh, 1,700 square foot building uh, doing what we do. The provincial budget gave you guys some money to keep going. Uh, what does that mean for this operation? Uh, that's huge. Uh, gives us time, uh, I guess, puts us in a position so I don't have to apply for my funding for the next number of years. Uh, also, I'd like to put out here that the Health Community Services also uh, gave us a, a one-time funding of a little over 55000 to help us with the move to upgrade all of our furniture, some of our technology stuff, so it's uh, very grateful for that, right? Tammy, the last time that we spoke, you guys were hoping to open up uh, in a different location, in a different town, and it didn't work out. Um, how does it feel to be so accepted in Carbon Air and supported? Absolutely love it. We have so many people in the town that wants to come by and help. Uh, there's a lady that cooks a meal every Tuesday and brings it in, and uh, we're full here on Tuesdays. And uh, yeah, I just absolutely love the support. And how many people are you uh, seeing coming through the door here now? Uh, June month, we had uh, 730 plus people that came through the doors. Uh, so therefore people know us now that we're in the community and uh, there's more people now reaching out for help. Awesome. Well, congratulations on your new space. Thank, Thank you very much. They look so happy mm -hmm. and, and such a change from the last time that they spoke with us. Absolutely. They did have some bad luck in nearby Victoria when the town voted against their proposed transition house, but it certainly seems like things are looking up for them now. And for those who uh, turned a U-turn. Absolutely.
Well, this giant iceberg threatening a community in Greenland seems to be moving away. Time now to meet our young athletes of the day. This is 11-year-old Ethan Cromwell from St. John's. He has a blue belt in Taekwondo. He also plays on his school's basketball team, the East Point Eagles. And he also coaches the junior NBA team. Congratulations, Ethan. And our second athlete of the day, Ryder Borden from Cornerbrook. Ryder is a hockey player who plays on Novice One as defense. This is Ryder's second year in minor hockey. Congratulations, Ryder. Probably not thinking about hockey right now no. with all the warm <laughs> temperatures, but before we get more info on the weather, mm -hmm. just have a look at this. This wow. massive iceberg it almost doesn't look real. It's been threatening a village in Greenland and it appears to be veering away from the coast, according to officials. Now, the village of Insuit is home to 169 people, some of whom have actually had to be evacuated. Yeah, the fear was that a big chunk of the berg uh, to break free and create a huge wave that would um, that powers their plant, shutting it down. The residents of the village say they're used to icebergs, but <laughs> not ones this big. Just look at that. Uh, 650 feet wide, and it rises nearly 300 feet above sea level. Wow. So you can imagine the water that would displace breaking off. Ooh, and it's got to be chilly Yeah. next to that iceberg, and too. And shadowy. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, it's certainly uh, not chilly in the province right now. Uh, some places are looking at some really high temperatures over the next few days. So I thought I would start with the current temperatures. How warm is it right now in the province? Well, it's still pretty warm in some places. Happy Valley Goose Bay is still sitting at 32 degrees at this hour. So it's going to be a very muggy night for folks in that area. We do have this heat warning uh, in effect for tomorrow. Humidex going up to about 
about 38 degrees, so it's going to be very, very warm for parts of Labrador tomorrow, even along the coast where it's usually a little bit chillier. And we also had this special weather statement in effect for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula for the showers that are going to be moving through tonight, a risk of really heavy downpours, potentially some flash flooding. And we also have the heat warning in effect for the Corner Brook area, Deer Lake, Humber Valley, uh, in through Buckins and Green Bay, uh, White Bay as well, and the fog advisory for the south coast of the island. So it's going to be very, very dense fog. If you're going in to be the, in that area, uh, be careful driving because the visibility will be low. And we do have these showers that are coming through uh, early tomorrow morning. It's going to be a pretty uh, cloudy day on the island tomorrow. Chance of some showers for most uh, places tomorrow. 20 degrees as the high in St. John's for tomorrow. Getting really warm in Grand Falls, Windsor, 25 degrees there and Corner Brook 28. So yes, that heat warning will certainly uh, be felt there tomorrow as well as in Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay, another hot, hot day uh, tomorrow, 33 degrees. And once again, with that humidex, it's going to feel much warmer than that. So as we head into uh, Wednesday, that weather, what weather is really going to stick around for a while. Unfortunately, we're not getting rid of it yet. So most places on the island and in Labrador is looking at uh, some showers on Wednesday. So cloudy with showers in the east, 24 degrees. Those temperatures staying really high though as well for central Newfoundland, 27 degrees with the chance of showers there. And uh, in Labrador, a little bit of a cool down. You can see in the west, uh, 16 degrees as the high for Wednesday afternoon noon. So as we uh, move along <laughs> during the week, we have uh, more rain coming through on Thursday. And yes, you can see that looks a bit heavier uh, than what we've been seeing lately with the patchy showers. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. And uh, temperatures once more uh, staying quite warm on the island. A little bit cooler here in uh, eastern Labrador, 18 degrees there. So a little bit of a, a reprieve for folks in Labrador from those hot temperatures. But you can see once we come out of this wet weather, things are starting to look up as we near the end of the week. So right now, Saturday uh, in the East is looking pretty good. Mix of sun and cloud and 23 degrees, 29 degrees on Saturday for central areas. So things are starting to dry off by the time we head into the weekend. So a nice break from that wet weather. Eastern Labrador, those temperatures are sticking around really 32 degrees for Saturday with a mix of sun and cloud. And for Western Labrador, a little bit wet, uh, wetter there for the next five days or so, but uh, it will stay warm. And that's your forecast. Back to you, Debbie. Thanks again, Carolyn. Well, a woman in Prince Edward Island has been charged in the death of two infants. Police say the charges come after a year-long investigation. Jessica Doria Brown has more and a warning. Details of this story are disturbing. The 39-year-old Charlottetown woman is facing six charges in total related to the death of two of her own children, born in 2014 and 2016. Police say both babies were carried full term and born alive, and the charges stem from an investigation that started back in March of 2017. Um, we had a report of um, a person concerned uh, with um, what turned out to be the accused in, in this incident, um, being pregnant on... Uh, on a couple of occasions uh, and uh, those pregnancies not resulting in, uh, in, um, in, in her having children. So that started the investigation and uh, from there uh, over the, the last year and, uh, and several months we've been working to build our case uh, and uh, find the answers to those questions what happened uh, during those pregnancies and uh, that uh, what we've come to realize is those those pregnancies resulted in uh, the individual having children and um, the children uh, unfortunately uh, um, being, um, being subject of, uh, of infanticide uh, as a result of, of the mother um, taking their lives. Well, they, they were disposed of uh, um, at this, unfortunately at this stage uh, it was indicated that they were put in the waste um, our officers, investigators, have been working with Island Waste Management to try to to see if uh, it's a, it's possible to locate the remains, uh, if possible. But we know a lot, unfortunately, that uh, a lot of our waste uh, goes to the incinerator uh, in Prince Edward Island. So um, 
we're not sure if that's going to be a possibility at this point, but if it is a possibility, we'll be doing um, certainly every effort we can to try to locate them. And police say right now the investigation is centered on whether or not it's going to be possible to find the remains of those two infants. They say nobody else has been charged in relation to this crime. The woman has been released from custody with conditions and she's scheduled to appear in court on Thursday. Jessica Doria Brown, CBC News, Charlottetown. An Edmonton family is pleading with Ottawa to reunite them with their mother. She was deported six months ago and separated from her two Canadian born children. Now their situation is being compared to what's happened to families in the U.S. Andrea Hunkar has the details. News of immigrant families torn apart in the United States caused a major backlash, but critics say it's happening here too. Six months ago, this mother was deported from Edmonton to Niger. Sally Mohammed was notified just hours before she had to go. It left little time to say goodbye to her Canadian children, Yusuf and Yasmina. I have no clue. Mohammed's husband says she arrived in Canada a decade ago after fleeing a forced marriage, but authorities rejected her claims for residency. In January, a federal court judge disagreed deportation could cause the children irreparable harm. Anusa Awadi can't help but draw comparisons of his own situation to immigrant families torn apart in the U.S. And I see Canadians, they condemn U.S. And I tell myself, I say, you condemn somebody, you have it in your backyard, in front of you. Now Awadi juggles heartache with single parenthood. By day, he feeds the kids and takes them to school and counseling, then works 12 hours each night while the children sleep at a neighbor's home. They wake up in the night, they ask her, when mommy coming? Advocates are calling on the government to do the right thing and expedite the family's reunion. From West Africa, Mohammed is making another attempt at permanent residency so she can come home. When you come back, mommy, we're going to celebrate a party for you. Andrea Huncart, CBC News, Edmonton. The first Canadian helicopters to be used as part of a UN peacekeeping mission have arrived in Mali. By the end of the month, eight helicopters will be in place, three Chinooks and five Griffins. They were flown in pieces to nearby Burkina Faso, then assembled there. The Canadians will fly primarily medical evacuation missions. One of the biggest challenges could be the extreme conditions. Weather and sand have been blamed for two helicopter crashes in Mali in recent years. Opposition conservatives blame the prime minister for the influx of migrants illegally entering Canada since January 2017. Liberals say the rate at which they arrived slowed this past spring, but that didn't stop the opposition from forcing an emergency meeting of the House Immigration Committee. I have no idea how much the government at the federal level has spent on tents, RCMP and CBSA overtime, transport, accommodation. We also have no idea how much the provincial governments have been required to spend on welfare, subsidized housing, emergency housing, food banks, education, daycare, health care and other costs. We also have no idea how much the government is planning on having to spend on the eventual removals of those found to have non-valid asylum claims. The opposition is demanding a series of meetings, including provincial input, input rather, in, uh, concluding in a review of the situation by August 3rd. Liberals say they already passed a motion for just that in May. Well, here's a look at today's viewer photo of the day. This is a pretty cool one of the Capelin rolling somewhere in the province. I'll let you know where this photo was taken after the break.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, it's no surprise, golf courses are a popular destination in the summer, but these arrivals were a little unexpected. Here's the baby bear. <laughs> <laughs> Two bears tumble right out of the forest and onto the fairway near Rossland, British Columbia. Now, the mother bear is known to the golf club, and apparently she doesn't pay much attention to the golfers, but... The golfers, on the other hand, are paying plenty of attention to the furry additions. And how could you not? But you that's don't want so to get any closer than no, that. No, that's about it. <laughs> well, have you ever ordered a pizza and couldn't finish it? Not me personally, <laughs> but it wouldn't be the case for this group either. But before we show you this, it's a little gross. Just a warning. Jeffrey Okay, you're looking at the winner of a pizza eating contest held just north of Toronto yesterday. Why? I keep asking <laughs> why. Contestants had 10 minutes to chow down on as many as 20 centimeter pizzas, as many as they could eat. The winner managed to stuff himself with 19 and a quarter pizzas. Oh, oh, well, my appetite is officially ruined. Yeah, no <laughs> pizza for supper tonight. No, definitely not. Yeah, well, maybe we, maybe some people will be having mm -hmm. people in for supper, Ronnie right? <laughs> just <laughs> said in my ear. So here's our viewer photo of the day. Yes. Isn't that fantastic? It is. That is fabulous. very cool. And this was taken in Middle Cove, mm -hmm. a very popular place for uh, when the Capelin roll. Yeah. I love to see the little ones come down with their little buckets and everything. Their They're nets. so excited. That's and a me great too. Shot. I haven't had any hit this year. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, sending that photo in. That's our program. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.